Hi everyone, I'm Tony Bernardo, Dean of the UCLA Anderson School of Management, and I'd like to welcome you to this panel discussion. This conversation is titled Fandom, and it's about audience and fan engagement and about what organizations are doing to hold on to their fans during this challenging period. We have a terrific panel today, and in some ways it's fitting that I'm making the introductions. Uh, I grew up in Toronto, a diehard hockey fan, and I'm not a fair weather fan. I've stuck with my team, the Toronto Maple Leafs, my entire life, even though they last won the Stanley Cup when I was 11 months old. So I'm delighted to introduce the moderator and panelists for this session. Our moderator today is Andy Campion, Chief Operating Officer for Nike, a role he served in for the past year. Andy has been an executive at Nike since 2007, previously serving as Chief Financial Officer and Executive Vice President. He also spent 11 years at the Walt Disney Company serving in a variety of senior roles there. Andy is a double Bruin with both his uh, BA, uh, class of 98, and his MBA, class of 2003 from UCLA Anderson, in addition to an LLM from the University of San Diego. And we're proud to say he's a member of our board of advisors here at Anderson. Welcome and thank you, Andy. Uh, next, I'll introduce our panelists. Francesco Aquilini is owner and chairman of the Vancouver Canucks hockey team and managing director of the Aquilini Investment Group founded half a century ago by Francesco's father, Luigi, an Italian immigrant. The group's diversified holdings include residential and commercial real estate, sports and entertainment, restaurants, hospitality, vineyards, and blueberry and cranberry farms, as well as the Canucks and the arena where the team plays. Francesco has a BA from Simon Fraser University in British Columbia and an MBA class of, two, of uh, 1994 from UCLA Anderson. He's also a board member of our Center for Management of Enterprise in Media, Entertainment and Sports. Welcome and thank you, Francesco. And I'm also very pleased to welcome and introduce Gary Bettman, who is the commissioner of the National Hockey League, a position he's held since 1993. Previously, he served as a senior vice president and general counsel to the National Basketball Association. He's a graduate of Cornell University and New York University School of Law. Gary is currently the longest serving active commissioner in professional sports, and in 2018, he was elected to the Hockey Hall of Fame. Welcome and thank you, Gary. I'm really looking forward to this conversation, and now I'll turn it over to Andy to get us started. Thanks, Andy. And thanks, Tony. Uh, good morning, fellow Bruins. Um, I have to start by correcting something Tony said. I wish I was the class of 98. I wish I was that young. I was the class of 93, but... Um, Spent 1989 to 1993 on campus, and then another three years later um, doing my um, fully employed MBA at UCLA. I love UCLA. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today. Um, there's another thing about I love about UCLA, and it ties to my passion for sports, and I'm sure these you're going to feel the passion for sport from our other two guests, um, is that we have this treasure trove of quotes from John Wooden that help guide us. And one of my favorites is, what's most important? is what you learn after you think you know it all, um, or after you think you're supposed to know it all, whatever it is. And obviously the theme there is go through life being more of a learn it all than a know it all. And frankly, nobody likes a know it all anyway, right? So um, I've been really fortunate uh, over, my, um, over my life, uh, you know, it's not just about career, to learn so many things from other people. I think it's pretty fair to say we've all learned everything we know from somebody else. Um, and I continue to do so. One of those people, I was fortunate as a young buck uh, back at Disney in the early 2000s to spend a little bit of time with Commissioner Gary Bettman um, as I was tasked with some work relative to the Anaheim Mighty Ducks. Um, learned a lot in that process, and we've now been reconnected thanks to uh, UCLA and thanks to our second guest, Francesco, who I uh, learned a ton from last week. Just met Francesco last week, but we spent about an hour, hour and a half, I think, on the phone and I got to hear some of his story. And um, what I hope you guys are all excited about is you now all get the opportunity to learn from their um, pretty incredible experiences. So with that, I have a little bit of a call to action. I'm gonna give you a head start or a heads up. Um, start to formulate uh, questions you would have for these two because we're gonna get an opportunity to ask them your questions in a few minutes here, but I'm gonna break the ice and get things rolling a little bit with a few questions, but um, but we'll be watching for those questions that you submit and try to get as many of those answered. So we're gonna start first with Francesco. So as Tony said, um, this session is all about fandom. 
he's a fan and we and I now have learned you were a fan. You grew up as a kid in Vancouver. Um, I don't remember the part of town. I think I think I do remember which direction it was, though. I think it was on the wrong side of the tracks, as you said. Um, mm -hmm. But from whatever that side of the tracks was, you found your way into the practice facilities and whatnot. And with this being about audience and fan engagement, um, I'd love for you to share some of what you shared with me with this audience around how you being a fan one led you to ultimately buying the franchise and two how being a fan has impacted your leadership and impact on the franchise and the community around vancouver canucks oh thanks andy uh, you know so I, I think it all starts with you know passion and the love of the sport and uh, i think every owner has that otherwise they wouldn't become an owner you know for me it started when uh, i was uh 10 years old and i, I grew up I grew up a block away from the old Pacific Coliseum where the Canucks used to play. And, uh, and so, you know, every game day I would, I would walk down to the rink and there's a little kid and try to get into the building. And sometimes I'd get in and sometimes I couldn't. And sometimes I could figure out a way how to sneak in because they used to have standing rooms back then. And uh, so, you know, my entire life, I've always been a big fan and uh, you know, over, over a span of, you know, you know, having very, very successful businesses and you've been blessed with, um, you know, great opportunities and done well in business. When the opportunity came up, um, you know, in the early 2000s, um, you know, we had, there was an out of town owner that didn't want to own the team anymore. And so, um, you know, the opportunity came up to, to buy the team. And, uh, you know, at that time, the, the fundamentals were much different. I mean, there was, there was no salary cap. The Canadian dollar was, at an all-time low and you know it was it was a struggle and uh you know many many franchises that had traded back then were you know people that um you know bought the teams for community support and when when i looked into this at the very beginning in early 2000s before the salary cap came in um that that was kind of the intention and uh you know i worked with a number of uh a number of groups uh, local groups that could possibly want to be involved um, you know, people changed their minds. It was, it was, it was a different world. I mean, in, in hockey, it was a completely different world. And, um, and so when, uh, when things started to get better, I mean, the, the ultimate turning point was the, you know, the salary cap. I mean, there was a big cost to it. it you know, the league had to lose a year for it. Um, but, um, you know, now the businesses are fundamentally sound and, you know, we've got great owners because people are more interested as opposed to just being a fan and writing checks, I think now the business is much more sustainable. So, um, you know, from, from that point of view, you know, being a local owner, um, you know, it has its, you know, you, you, you're passionate about it. I mean, you know, you care about the team. You want to see the team do well. And, um, and when it doesn't do well, you know, you, you kind of have to take the heat. And, and believe me, there's a lot out of it because, you know, fans, especially in Canada where, you know, hockey is the primary sport here and it's, you know, it's covered by the media, you know, there's a lot of scrutiny. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that you want to, you want to, you want to be part of. And, uh, because I mean, it's all about your community at the end of the day, you, you, you try, you try to do your best for the community. And so, um, <clears throat> the second part of that question, and you said about how does it affect the leadership? I mean, I think, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, how you run a team, an owner hires a general manager, hires, a, you know, hires a coach and, you know, they, they're, they're the hockey experts. They're the ones who, who spend, you know, 18 hours a day thinking about hockey and thinking about how to make the team better and how to, how to do things that, you know, can entertain the fans. And so, I mean, as an owner, all you can do is support them. Um, you know, they provide you with a plan. Um, you know, at what point of the cycle are you in the sports cycle you're in? Uh, you know, if you're in a rebuilding stage or, you know, your players are getting a little bit older and you have to bring in new players, um, you know, it all depends. So, the, you know, the, the management team, you know, uh, you know, provide a plan and then, you know, the owner can critique it, can talk about it, can provide some suggestions, give his input. But then once it's agreed upon, you know, that plan has to be carried forward. So it's really supporting the people that are in place and, uh, uh, you know, giving them all the tools available, giving them whatever they whatever they need to succeed. Um, you know, I, um, 
there was another element of, of growing up a fan and growing up in the community. Francesco, I know that um, it was important to you as an owner to not just focus on the business of running the franchise or even the, 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 the sport objectives of winning, but kind of to reach back and pull people forward in the community. Did you want to share any um, perspective that you, like what you shared with me on how you and your, your leaders um, do that based on that kind of just um, that, that affinity that you have for the community in which you grew up? Oh, for sure. I mean, and especially during COVID, you know, when, uh, when everything shut down, you know, we were, it was kind of like we were in a deer in the headlights. We didn't, we never expected anything like this. We never, we never encountered anything like this. The most we've ever, you know, had was losing a year in a lockout. I mean, that was expected, you know, maybe a snowstorm or something, but something like what happened, we just were not prepared and we had to pivot. And so, and, and, you know, that was, that was challenging. Um, but, you know, at, at the same time, everybody was going through the same thing. And, you know, the community here, you know, really supported the Canucks, you know, since since the franchise was awarded in 1970. So it was our job to give something back. So we started, you know, providing, um, you know, community kitchen where, you know, we would provide meals to people who needed it. And so to date, we've, uh, we've given like about 500,000 meals, you know, to, you know, homeless shelters, senior citizens homes, and it's still ongoing. And so, you know, I think those type of things are really important. I mean, it's always about giving back to your community. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. I know when I had the opportunity to meet you last week, it just reminded me of that um, notion that, you know, there's that saying out there, it's business, it's not personal. But I think what we all realize over time is it's business and it's personal. And um, yeah. I loved hearing that story. And transitioning to, uh, to, uh, to Gary, um, you know, one of the themes embedded in what you said, Francesco, through this pandemic, we've certainly realized at Nike as well, as well over time, is that the passion for sport is, is strong and con constant. But, but in business, nothing's ever linear. And um, we're fortunate to have the commissioner uh, of the NHL on, on the call, the, the, the person, Gary Bettman, who's been the commissioner for, he's in his 29th year. And so in some respects, Gary, um, some would probably say you're in your 29th year, you've seen it all. Um, but I have a hunch that over the last year, you, like the rest of us have seen some things, you know, that are just unprecedented and we've never seen before. Um, would you, would you mind, or not, would you mind? I know you wouldn't mind, but would love to have you share with the audience some of the challenges or opportunities or learnings that you've had over the last year, um, uh, for someone like, like I said, who, who probably going into last year had maybe thought he'd seen it all. Well, you never quite think you've seen it all. And Andy, thank you for having me and to everybody in the audience. It's great to be with you. And I always love to be with Francesco because he is an outstanding owner who is incredibly passionate about the game. Also, as you were talking about Coach Wooden and his quote about learning something new every day, uh, I learned today that Francesco Aquilini used to sneak into hockey games. That's that's something that I'm going to make a mental note of for other yeah. situations. Uh, getting, getting to your question, uh, we've had a lot of experiences, uh, for better or for worse. Uh, I was the first commissioner of a major sports league to shut down for a full season because of collective bargaining. Uh, Francesco alluded to that with respect to the league getting a salary cap, which made a fundamental difference uh, not only in terms of how we operate economically, but it actually changed the game on the ice because it gave us the most extraordinary competitive balance in all of sports and has made the game healthier and has enabled us to grow. But over the last 29 years leading up to this year, which yes, is unique in every way and all the wrong ways, uh, it was always important that we had an organization and organizations at the league level and at the club levels that were hardworking, that were creative, that were passionate about the game, and perhaps most importantly, and we're seeing it this year, are agile and flexible. Uh, we have had to react to things we've never seen before. Uh, I've been accused at times during the last year of making it up on the fly, and I'll plead guilty to that. 
Um, but what you have to do, particularly in a position of leadership, is you have to understand all the data that's available to you. You have to focus on making good decisions. You have to focus on all of your options. And then you have to be able to execute on those options, which is what we've had to do as recently as this past weekend when we were playing two outdoor games in Lake Tahoe. And after the first period of the first game, weather related, we basically lost the ice. Uh, and we were able to recover very nicely. This is a long-winded way of saying is this is a unique circumstance, but an organization that has committed hardworking people at all levels and is understands its business and does its homework is in a position to, to do the things that are necessary to whatever circumstances you may be confronted with. And to echo, I guess, some of the theme of, of our discussion and what Francesco said, one of the things we've learned, which is pretty obvious though, but up until this point hasn't been talked about a lot, is our game, all major sports, is about the fans. We bring people together. We bring people of very diverse, dissimilar backgrounds together in pursuit of a common emotional goal. That's supporting their team and winning and the excitement that goes with the game. Uh, playing without fans in person is, is something where it's clear in our game. We get an energy as a sport. Our fans get an energy from having our sold out buildings every night, loud, you know, emotional, excited, uh, and we miss that. And during the last year, we've had to pursue other avenues to make sure that we're connecting with our fans. Uh, yes, putting on games on television, using social media, creating special content, and even creating special events like we did this, this past weekend with the outdoor games in Lake Tahoe. So it's, it's a long-winded way of saying that we have an ecosystem that starts with the fans. It's important that we connect with the fans, but we've got to be flexible and agile enough to react to whatever the circumstances are to bring our game to our fans. Well, that's great. Before I open it up to uh, questions from the audience, and we're starting to get some, I had one more question that was um, for both of you. So I um, was fortunate, like I said, to meet Gary in the early 2000s. And, and in a parallel life, Francesco was uh, pursuing uh, ownership of the Vancouver Canucks in the early 2000s. And, it, and that was a pretty trying time for the NHL. Um, you'd, you'd mentioned around the collective bargaining agreement, et cetera. Um, having reconnected with you, the from to for me is 16, 17 years ago to today and seeing just the extraordinary value that you've created as the commissioner, that you, Francesco, and other owners have created. Um, it's just, it's incredible. Um, and I think what we all know is that, you know, creating economic value, especially in a business that has fans, starts with creating value for the fans. So if I could ask you guys to set um, your modesty aside for the moment, um, what are you most proud of in terms of um, fan engagement or, or what you've done to, to create so much value and kind of enthusiasm around the game in that, uh, over, that, over that past 15 years? Francesco, okay. why don't okay, you sure. so, Okay, so I think, um, uh, you know, in the sports, in the sports business, it's you're in the entertainment business. So I think what's happened recently, even within the last 10 years, is that it's all about the experience, you know, as soon as you, you know, park your car, walk into the building, the food, um, how you treated the service, um, how, you know, how the, how the team connects, you know, digitally with the fan, because that's now how, that's now how we communicate. You know, 99% of all our communication is digital, you know, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter. And so it's, it's um, today the fans are more engaged than they ever have been. You know, 20 years ago, you never had that, you know. Um, 20 years ago, you know, it was more traditional, whereas today it's instant and you, you can get mass communication, you know, um, just on one Twitter. And, you know, there was an example where, um, you know, we had an anthem singer kind of went offside. He went to an anti-mask anti rally and, um, 
you know that's that's not something we accepted as an organization and uh and so you know the response was overwhelmingly you know 95 percent in favor and uh you know kind of went viral and and so that was you know that's one way to engage your fans and so fans need, they want to feel part of the team they want to connect to the players i think um you know players today are um in the league are, are, are much more highly skilled um you know, their training facilities are better, uh, the skill level is better, and um, and so the entertainment value is much higher. So um, again, you know, I think I think providing an entire experience is what is what is what makes these teams successful, as opposed to just winning games. It's more about because you know you can't control the results, but you can kind of control the experience. Yeah, that's. Um, uh, I just I'd like just to just echo. Now, what Francesco said, and I agree with him, but I'd also like to add the, there's an authenticity to our game. Uh, there's the competitiveness and the emotion to our game, which which makes it compelling to our fans. Uh, if you look at the, the stats, our fans tend to be the most avid. Uh, they're the best educated. They're the most affluent, and they're the most tech savvy and they skew the youngest. And what that tells you is we have to give them an experience on their terms. So we've got to give them a great game and we've got to give them what they want, when they want it, how they want it, which is something that we've all had to adapt to in the digital age, particularly with social media, because particularly young fans, they want more about the game. And whether it's shoulder programs, whether it's behind the scenes, whether it's more data, which is why we've invested so heavily in creating more data, our relationships with major data companies and the creation of what we call puck and player tracking, which creates millions of data points a game. All of this is designed to get another connection point to a game that, as it relates to the team level, game night, the total experience that Francesco alluded to is, is vitally important. We want them to come in, feel good about their association with the game. And consistent with that, we're also doing more than ever before at the grassroots level, getting young people to know and play the game and love the game, uh, and making sure that we're more diverse and inclusive than we've ever done before. Uh, we've got a fire on all cylinders. You can't silo it and pick one or two things that you're going to do. You've got to give everybody the full experience, no matter who they are, where they come from, and what they want. Well, I think um, there were three things I, I learned from you guys in, the, in that that I'll just crystallize. One starts with, um, I met you, Gary, when I was at Disney, and I got a little taste of the business of sports through the Ducks and the Angels and ESPN. And I had this insatiable demand and decided to go to Nike and spend 365 days a year, 24 hours a day um, on it. And I think, you know, what we probably all three experience is that there is this, this un insatiable, overwhelming demand for sport. And what you guys have done an amazing job is taken all of these developments from a technology or connectivity, maybe more to put it in more layman's term perspective, um, and use those levers to tap to fulfill that demand and, and fuel even more demand. It's been amazing. Um, a couple other things you guys said um, that I, I just would crystallize for the, for the crowd, so to speak, is, you know, I loved what you said, Francesco, about fans are looking kind of for, for more than just the game. They're looking for what are the values behind the brand that they want to associate with. If they're going to wear that name on the front of their jersey around town, they want to know what are the Vancouver Canucks value, you know, in addition to not beyond because it's irrelevant winning, but in addition to winning. And, and I think, I think we've all kind of learned that in all walks of, of business. And then um, love what you said, Gary, because it's certainly something that, um, you know, our founder, Phil Knight, whose birthday it is today, actually um, at 83, he would tell you that he we're spent the last 50 or 60 years. And well, he's, he spent the last 50 or 60 years realizing that, you got to just keep doing it over again. You got to get that next generation to be as excited about the thing that the last generation was. And that starts with grassroots and kids. And that's obviously fulfilling for a lot of us too. So, so with that, I'm going to transition to a question from 
our audience. And it's one that may have been spurred by something you said earlier, Gary, but um, the question is around the Tahoe games. Um, and the question is essentially, um, it was a very flattering question. It said it was a, it was a great uh, event and experiment and a way to pivot from traditional um, indoor, but also even some traditional outdoor events to, to an outdoor event. Um, how do you see that maybe impacting the future of the NHL as you look at next season, as we're in this kind of emergence from COVID period and some of the learnings, do you see outdoor events potentially becoming a bigger, I guess, piece of the puzzle? Well, actually, and that's a great question. We, we've done over 30 outdoor games. They've become a hallmark of, of our special events. And this is the first time we, we had problem we had on Saturday, even though when we take the game outside and we've got to provide good, safe ice for the players, uh, we, we've never had to deal with it quite the way we did this year. Uh, playing in, an, in a unique, beautiful surrounding that captured the imagination of fans, bringing the game back to its roots. So many of our players and so many of our fans learned to skate and play hockey outdoors. Uh, we thought this would be a novel concept, and we knew this year there wouldn't be fans, and so we wanted to yet give fans a special event, yet another connection point to the game. Uh, we're going to continue to do outdoor games, but I believe, as I said early on, the energy and strength of our game and for our players comes from our fans. And so one more than 30 with fans and we've done these two i envision us continuing to have special events and doing outdoor games but we want to do it in front of fans as beautiful as the lake tahoe setting was all right so i'm uh, looking for a couple more questions so um one of the um the questions relates to how you communicate with fans and so um and, and specifically in the current environment. You guys touched on this a little bit, but maybe a little bit um, deeper perspective into over the past year, I think one of the things all of us as business leaders have realized is there are a lot of dynamics at play for people, a lot of emotion, uh, you know, people are in very different places. And what we've tried to do is, is just get a sense for where everyone, everyone is and kind of whether it's, whether it's in a somewhat kind of old school way surveys or other ways to just get a sense for where people are at. How have you guys over the past years, over the past year, evolved how you connect with fans and, and sense um, what's going on with their fans, kind of what they expect from, from the league going forward? We're, we're constantly looking for feedback. We're constantly doing data research, getting fan opinions. On a, on a myriad of issue, we created a, a fan inclusion committee where we actually have fans give us feedback and meet on a regular basis. Uh, but the, the, the growth of social media has given us a key look at what people are thinking. And as you dated me by saying 29 years and the oldest, longest serving commissioner, you know, when I started doing this job, Sports leagues didn't have websites. The iPhone, I think, was 11 years from being on the market. And so what we've had to do, and this is my point about agility and evolving, is we've had to evolve to create content and create connectivity for fans on their terms. So they're getting the connection they want in the market by monitoring it very carefully we get a sense of what our fans are telling us they like and they don't like. We get great ideas from our fans, uh, but in the final, and the clubs all do this too. So they get a sense of what the experience is that the fans are getting that they like and they don't like. And all of our clubs have, have vibrant social media departments whose express purpose is to provide content, but also keep their fingers on the pulse of their fans. All right. So maybe this one will go to Francesco, um, both of you, but um, 
I, I have a hunch you've been asked this question a few times. I think there's some movies on uh, on this topic, starting with Moneyball and otherwise. But how have how have how has data how have data and analytics impacted your leadership over a franchise? Um, I know you rely on general managers and coaches. Um, are they increasingly relying on data and analytics to shape the team um, in terms of the players on the team to shape how the team plays? Um, maybe you could share some thoughts on, again, just the leverage of data and analytics in today's game. Yeah, Andy. So um, that definitely is having an impact because, you know, as we, you know, progress into the digital world, you know, data collection is becoming more and more important. And then how you get it, you know, it's all about how you get it, what you do with it. And, um, you know, our, our guys are, are, are doing some things, you know, on the ice and off the ice. And so some of the, some of the on ice stuff they're doing is this, um, you know, they have to measure performance is this catapult system, you know, where, you know, it tracks, you know, on ice workloads, uh, you know, they use it in preseason, not allowed to use it in games, but preseason is in practice, uh, measures power stride, you know, asymmetry in your legs or, or, or measures distance, velocity, all those type of things. I understand that now the league is, is uh, starting to do a, a, a dumbed down version. They're putting in the Jersey. And they're doing it in the game, which they can, you know, you can, you can, you can see on TV when they go, uh, you know, Connor McDavid does, uh, you know, goes to 30 miles an hour or something like that, you know, so that definitely is coming into play now. Um, you know, there's also like this thing called force tape, pl uh, force uh, play testing, um, which is kind of uh, measures your, your, the force of your stride and all those type of measurements. So that's, that's something that's, um, that's ever evolving and, you know, again, Andy, we were talking about the Nike Sports Science Center, you know, they're the leading edge on that, you know, and uh, and also different, you know, Corsi index. And so all that all that stuff is used right now. I mean, it's it's evolving and uh, it's just it's just getting it's it's getting more more relevant. I think now there was a time period where people, the managers or coaches would look at it and they'd say, oh, this is just the garbage. But I think now it's becoming more relevant. And um <laughs> especially for the, for the newer generation, you know? Yeah. The uh, data uh, and analytics, I think, can give insights and give you a view, either one you didn't have or confirmatory in terms of how you're evaluating uh, your players, how your team's performing. Uh, in the final analysis, it takes a really strong general manager to put the chemistry together. But important, and, and I think the importance is confirmed by the fact that we have very strong relationships with SAP, Apple, Verizon, and Amazon, all of which are working with us to create data platforms, particularly in video, that will help our players and our coaches play and coach better. And at the same time, give our fans greater insight into the game. Uh, I had referred to it before and, and Francesco just mentioned puck and player tracking, understanding, you know, not just how far and how fast players are skating, but where they are in relationship to each other in certain game situations and whether or not those situations resulted in success or failure, goal, goal scored upon you. These are all things that in effect enable us to take what is the fastest game and bring current fans into it more deeply than they've ever been before. And at the same time, for sports fans who may not have been hockey fans, it gives them an opportunity to understand what they're seeing and form an attachment and love for the game. So data does a whole bunch of things to make the game better and to make the experience better for our fans. Yeah, well, I, um, I can't speak to the leverage of data and analytics in, in managing a team. I'm, I'm like everyone else in the audience. I can only dream of owning a sports franchise, but I can speak to the leverage of data and analytics with respect to Nike. Um, as Francesco touched on, you know, over time at Nike, we used a lot of experience and intuition to innovate with respect to the product. Um, 
and increasingly we're ever able to leverage science. So like you said, force plate basketball uh, courts, force plate soccer pitches, um, tracks with force plate, motion capture, et cetera. Um, and it's, it's, it's enabled us to, instead of, I, you know, I think we all remember, it used to be about like, be like Mike, like if he can perform at this level, then, you know, the shoes must be good or, or, you know, the, the Spike Lee, it's gotta be the shoes. It's a question mark, you don't know, but I think, um, what we're increasingly finding, and I'm sure you guys are, is that the science is, is helping, um, I would say either confirm or amplify the intuition. The intuition isn't lost. There's still, what I love about sports is there's, there's still so much intangible to it. There's mindset, there's drive, mm -hmm. there's passion, um, et cetera. Um, and then increasingly we're able to marry that up with, with science. So um, the next question we've gotten from the audience, not surprisingly, because this is the Anderson Graduate School of Management or the business school is, um, how have the economics of the game um, shifted or changed over the last, say, 10, 20 years, uh, potentially based on, on the proliferation of kind of digital engagement or digital um, media, um, but just otherwise? I think one of the things we talked about before the call was 15, 20 years ago, um, uh, there, there was a belief that everything was going to go digital and nobody was going to go anywhere. Everyone was going to sit in their home playing video games or streaming. And, and um, I know that that's actually changed as well. It's not just a shift toward digital. But the punchline question being, how have the economics of the, of the game shifted or changed most significantly over the last 10 or 20 years? Well, I think from, from our standpoint, it's been twofold. One, uh, there have been new and increased revenue streams from all sorts of media, traditional media, digital platforms, social media, and the like. And I think that's going to continue to grow because content is and always has been and always will be king uh, in terms of what people value. Secondly, uh, we have, and Francesca, the salary cap, we have a, a cap in the major sports. And there's a direct tie between revenue growth, which has been growing at a very healthy clip up until this year, uh, and the players share in that 50-50 uh, with us. Uh, we don't pay a penny less, we get a penny more. And that has given us a stability, which is enabling ownership to do more investing uh, in infrastructure, arenas, and, and the fan experience. Uh, this past season, or the season that we're engaged in now, uh, you have to rewrite the books. Everybody's losing a lot of money in every sport. Fans are, are an economic part of the game. Roughly for us, 50% of our revenues directly and indirectly uh, come from fans attending games. And so when, when we look at what's going on this year, uh, the revenues are down, obviously dramatically and again the player's share goes down as well uh, and so it's a shared experience although still very costly uh, we believe though that the stability that our system gives us will enable us to emerge on the other side and come out even stronger so um got a question relative to expansion and, and it was prompted a little bit by seattle um and uh, and relative to uh, the geographic proximity that that the that Vancouver has to Seattle, but maybe to frame the question up this way, how how do you Gary think about about expansion? I think that the the group um, would would love to hear what are some of the parameters you work through in thinking about whether expansion makes sense or not in a specific area, and then maybe Francesco, you know, we were talking earlier um, about the fact that sometimes here in the U.S. We forget that Canada is an entirely different country. Um, I know you can drive from Seattle to Vancouver. Um, yeah. Does 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 is there are there are there kind of um, relationships between the new Seattle franchise and Vancouver, or do you just look at it as another team you're going to beat? So I mean, first of all, <laughs> it's I think another team to beat. What's that? I said it's another team you want to beat, but you've That's got right. a geographic exactly. line. Yeah, 
So I mean, it. it uh, I mean, it, it's you know having a team in Seattle is, is beneficial to us in many ways, right? First, the travel. Um, you know, you're going to create rivalries. It's within driving distance. Um, you know, I think the Northwest is a great market. I think Seattle has always been a great hockey market, and you know, it's good for the league. Um, you know, I think they the the, the 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 building sold out. I mean, it's been it sold out in, th- in three hours, I think, or something like that. And so. Um, you know, you always look at it from a 90,000 foot level. Is it good for the league? And, uh, and so, and then, and then, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have fans drive down to Vancouver and you're going to have Seattle fans come up, you know, uh, to, to, to come to Vancouver to watch games. So it's, you know, it's, 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 a, I think it's a value add as opposed to a minus it's a plus, you know, that's, that's kind of how I see it. And, you know, of mm-hmm. course it all depends how the team performs, but you know, that's always the battle, right? You always try to put the best product in the ice and compete every night. And that's, that's what the fans expect, right? They just want, they want to see a team that can compete. And uh, so I, I think it's a, it's a great thing. I, w- I was, since day one, I've been in support. I, I've always uh, said to everybody that uh, I think it, it helps the Canucks. I think it helps the league. It helps the Canucks in, in so many different ways. Well, before we transition over yeah, here, I was going to say a quote the other day that said, um, when I race, I worry about a lot of things. Who's going to come in second and who's going to come in third? So I, I assume that's, uh, that it does create kind of that, that competitive, those competitive juices for you guys in Vancouver. And, you know, it's always a great thing about rivalry in sports. Those are, the, those are the aspects of sports we all love the most. But, Gary, you were going to share some of how you think about expansion. Well, when we look at a franchise and an expansion possibility, the three factors you look at, and the same applies with new ownership. Uh, you look at ownership, which is most important. You look at the market, you look at the arena, and as important as those factors for an expansion team is, will it make the league stronger? Uh, if you look at our experience in Las Vegas, now everybody looks at it and says, Oh, of course, the NFL's there, everybody's looking at that was obvious. That wasn't the case when we did it. We, we knew what we were doing, but we had a lot of critics. Uh, Seattle was for us a great untapped market, creating a, a driving geographic rival for the Canucks, we thought would be sensational. Uh, because of our competitive balance, uh, we think this team will come in uh, and be the biggest goal. Golden Knights were in their first year and have been since. So we view this as a win-win. It gives us an opportunity to touch another market, to touch another group of fans who haven't been able to connect with NHL as much. And everything that's going on in Seattle has been sensational. David Bonderman and his ownership group, uh, Todd Laywick as CEO, a first-rate job of engaging that city uh, and this is a franchise that's going to start by being one of our strongest franchises, certainly off the ice. That's great. The, um, you touched on something there, Gary, that um, is a great segue to one of the other questions. You talked about um, tapping into different fans. Um, how, uh, how is the league thinking about um, promoting diversity within its fan base? So engaging with, with, I, you you touched on the the kind of geographic dimension. Um, what about the um, the sort of demographic dimensions of the fan base that, and, and how are you thinking about connecting with those different demographics in new ways? We've got to make ourselves more welcoming, and we have to give more people at all ages an opportunity to come into the game, whether it's grassroots programs for children, whether it's educational programs tied to hockey that we bring to schools, the public schools, uh, whether it's our hiring practices, whether it's the way elite players get developed and making sure that there's an opportunity for every young player who's developing at elite level, no matter what his or her background is, to become part of the game of hockey. Uh, and we have, we've created uh, a whole department uh, under Kim Davis, uh, who used to run our city and inclusive business at JP Chase, and has to guide us through making sure that we're doing all of the things that are necessary 
both from an effort standpoint and entry standpoint and be feeling welcome and included in the game. That's not something you can do overnight. It's not throwing a light switch. We've done lots over the last 20 years, not enough, and we're redoubling and tripling our efforts to do more than ever before. So um, another question, again, potentially not surprising from a, a business school audience. Um, gambling has, has obviously proven to be a, a huge business. Um, it's a business that, yes. um, that has kind of, you know, gone through a transition itself in terms of the public eyes and, and the, the sort of social perspective on it. You mentioned the franchise in Las Vegas. Um, how, uh, how has your, what is your perspective on the relationship between the sport and gambling relative to the sport? And, um, and maybe how has that evolved over time? Well, it, it certainly has evolved over time because I was one of the leading uh, advocates of sports betting, and then the United States Supreme Court uh, overruled PASPA. And as we discussed in the first question, uh, I was able to show some flexibility and agility in, a, in adapting quickly. Uh, it is a fact of life. It is another type of connection plans and we've used it as an opportunity to grow revenues, both in terms of fan engagement and in terms of, of marketing partners, both using our IP branding and using our data uh, to create a fan experience. And so it's a fact of life and you use it in any way you can to help continue to grow your business. Uh, whether or not you have moral uh, issues with it or not is irrelevant because it has the hope that more and more states are continuing to adapt it. Uh, in Canada, they don't yet have single game betting, uh, but we're encouraging that as well because we, we don't want the Canadian clubs or the Canadian fan experience to differ materially from the same experience that you can have in the United States. Well, we have, we have time for one more question. Um, and, um, the, um, I guess one of the questions would be, um, how do you, how do you see the kind of media, uh, landscape with respect to hockey, uh, shaping up over time? There's obviously a lot of discussion about broadcast partners, digital partners, streaming partners. Um, do you see significant evolution in terms of, um, what we used to maybe call TV deals, but all of a sudden all of those companies are streaming companies or they have a plus at the end of their name, whether it's Paramount Plus or, or Disney Plus, et cetera. Do you see the, the media platforms um, shape, uh, changing significantly relative to the NHL over time? I, I think they're going to continue to evolve uh, just as we went from over the air to cable and satellite. Uh, and now to streaming content, as I said before, is vitally important to whatever platform you're creating. And there's a lot of interest in all sports being carried, whether it's linear uh, or whether it's on digital platform. That is going to continue to, to grow opportunities for sports, all sports to touch their audience uh, is going to continue to increase. Uh, the marketplace right now, because of what the economic conditions are, uh, is, is making things a little more interesting than, than a pure hockey stick upward in terms of growth. But in the final analysis, with all the streaming platforms and the evolution of linear carriage, there will be more and more opportunities uh, for sports leagues to touch their fans and hopefully make more money. So, so maybe we'll we'll um, we'll wrap with a a, a kind of just fun one around sports, Francesco. So, um, uh, having been with Nike for a while, I've been fortunate to meet a few owners over time, and one of the things that uh, that I've found is um, it's it much like in any walk of life, you you kind of you, you you sort of set a goal, which is I'm trying to beat something, etc. And what I've found more often than not is that uh, there are a couple teams out there that are a little bit of that, um, they're like the foil for an owner. They're, 
whether it's the rival or just maybe the team that they're most worried about beating or most in, most concerned about, when you look around the NHL and you're shaping your team with your GM, who are who are those teams out there and why uh, that really you look at as we need to build a team that can beat that team? What teams out there right now do you go? You know, if you think about other leagues, which I won't mention um, because we're talking mm-hmm. hockey here, we're not talking about other sports. But there, in a lot of in a lot of leagues, people go like, "I got to build a team that can beat this super team or that super team." Who are those teams out there that you guys, when you're sitting around with your GM and your coaches, you go like, "We got to build a team that can compete at this level and beat th- these teams." Yeah. So the the first thing you have to do is to make the playoffs, and uh, so you have to look within your division. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's baby steps. It's baby steps, yeah. you know, I mean, um, and, uh, you know, for, you know, a, a few years back, you know, we had a good team, you know, for a number of years and you can kind of over, you can say, oh, you know, we're the best team in the division. We, we can bypass that and think about the next division. But at our stage now, it's like we, we our, our goal is to make the playoffs. And uh, like last year, you know, we made the playoffs and, you know, we kind of won the first round. It was kind of unexpected. And so, you know, in, in hockey, when, when you make the playoffs, anything can happen. And uh, there are a number of like eight seed teams that won the Stanley Cup. You know, um, you know you've know, got when St. Louis won, they were the last team in the league in three months into the season. So, so many things can happen. And so the goal is really just to make the playoffs because, you know, like Scotty Bowman once told me, he says, you basically need two teams, you know, one, one for the regular season, one. And uh, and so in, in in our division, you know, you've got the top teams, and and uh, you know, there's it's it's always the teams that are closest to you in your division, like the Calgarys, the Edmonton, Winnipegs. You know, those are kind of, and then Seattle will probably come into that mix as well. So it's always the teams that are kind of around you. You know, that like LA is always competing with Anaheim, sort of thing. You know, and yeah. uh, so. Um, we kind of don't really look beyond our division at this point, you know, in, in our stage in our sports cycle, you know. I, lo- I, I love it. It's great insight. And I didn't realize I was learning this at the time. But when I think back to that era where I met Gary and, and I was I was I was having fun focusing on the Ducks um, the, with Disney, that idea of you just got to get to the playoffs because then who knows what can happen back then, I think. I think you could summarize it as the Ducks made it to the playoffs and they weren't expected to do much either. But then who knows what could happen? It, it ended up being a guy named J.S. Jiggy. Jiggy. They basically, right. once they got to the playoffs, that goalie got hot, and then they just got on a roll. And so um, um, I'll just end there. That it's, it's, it's the right place to end. I think for those of us who, um, you know, I, I, I count my lucky stars. Um, in fact, back to our founder, Phil Knight, I thanked him today for the impact that this company has had on so many people's lives because – we're really fortunate to get to work in the business of sports um, because it is a business. It's complicated. It's intellectually stimulating. And to that last question, it's fun. And so um, we're also fortunate to be associated with UCLA because um, thanks to UCLA, we get to have individuals, individual leaders like yourselves join and, and share learnings and insights. So I can't thank you enough. And I think maybe I'll just close by saying go Bruins. And I mean the UCLA Bruins, not the Boston Bruins. Okay.